Welcome back to Mini Mayhem. I'm Ostrich Vox, and today we're breaking down Star Wars The Force of Evil Season 4, The Pony Head Show, and Surviving the Spider Bites. Of course, spoiler warning if you have not seen these episodes, go watch those and come back. Ready? Let's go. Starting with The Pony Head Show, where we are introduced to Pony Head's variety show, which could be a parody of series such as Saturday Night Live, The Amanda Show, all that, and maybe iCarly? The absurdity of it all, yet having grounded elements, reminds me of all of the aforementioned. We also have the return of a slew of characters, Ponyhead's sisters, Ponyhead's ex-boyfriend, and Fool Duke's monkey, who are all a part of the show's crew, marking Ponyhead's ex's third appearance in the show, and Monkey's third appearance in the season. They're really committing to him, huh? Eclipse's guitar she strung together from Total Eclipse of the Moon also makes another appearance, after popping up last week in Moon Remembers, though they do draw attention to the fact it's composed out of a decomposed skeleton. As Marco and Kelly prepare for their cooking segment, Kelly questions if cooking shows are fake, to which Marco retorts they're genuine, but deflects by saying, wrestling is fake, which of course alludes to the much heated debates in real life over if both of these genres are legitimate. If you have played Undertale, you may recall a similar joke with Metaton during one of his boss fights. And this is a little bit off topic, but Kelly's reaction to Marco's claim of wrestling being fake reminds me of another host right here on the round table. You know him, you love him, Tom. Tom is very much into wrestling, and if Marco said that to him, well, there wouldn't be any more Marco Diaz. Actually, Actually, I don't think Tom cares too much about that aspect, huh? Moving on, Ponyhead singing on top of a piano, outfit and all, serves as an allusion to the many, many female singers who have given a similar performance at some point in their careers on live television. Ponyhead's ex plugging the use of reflected cord magic technology as a way to control the Kingdom of Muni's viewership of Ponyhead's show is a continuity gag towards the entire reflected cord thing that really first started in his second appearance, Bamu Patty. Oh man, he's... he's so... creepy. I feel as if this episode also has a bit of commentary on how the audience feels about Ponyhead. If you ever dabbled in the Star fandom, you'll know that Ponyhead is a very despised character. But if you ask me, I don't really mind her. And I accepted long ago that Ponyhead as a character isn't going to change. And I don't think she should. Ponyhead would no longer be Ponyhead if she didn't act like Ponyhead. She could mature, but her entire Valley Girl shtick will never dissipate. But that aside, Eclipse begins to perform a song that really reflects her feelings and stake in everything. She woke up free from her crystal, suddenly to find herself in the middle of madness, Muni winding down from an invasion, and herself stripped away from her family, but now she has a chance to make things right for everyone, and she wants to at least try. Unfortunately, Muni is very resistant to Eclipse's melody, though it didn't help it was forced onto them. But her song sticks to one citizen, a young girl, who gives the only satisfactory response to the performance. I think it's important that they illustrated this one happy viewer as someone who's very young, as it shows hope for the youth of Muni. Much like in real life, the older someone is, the harder it is to break them out of their prejudice. Truth be told, I don't know if we're ever going to see the general populace of Muni except Eclipsa and Monsters as anything above awful due to their age and preconceived notions. But kids are different. They are born into the world with fresh, open eyes and are becoming more and more capable of forming their own opinions. With a young, influential figure such as Star Butterfly and Eclipsa showing her genuine, true self, something that a lot of the queens tried to hide, evident with events such as Song Day, you guys remember what Moon said, they don't care to learn about the true princesses and queens. The Kingdom of Muni would prefer a puff piece. I think Eclipsa will find more and more fans in this youth. Things aren't as hopeless as it all seems. And before we close off on that hopeful note, we need to address that Kelly pretty much asked out Marco, inviting him to whip up some recipes at her place. We know next week is the episode Kelly's World, which is the last segment before Curse of the Blood Moon, the next half hour episode in the series. So I think that episode may end with Marco realizing, or at least feeling, that the Blood Moon is influenced him in some way. But I'll try to talk about Starco sometime this week before Curse of the Blood Moon. So stay tuned and subscribe with notifications on. That being said, let's move on to Surviving the Spider Bites. The title of this episode could be a reference to the 2002 children's novel Surviving the Apple Whites, though its premise is completely off from this 
episode. Where, as Star prepares a dinner for the Spider Bite family, we catch a glimpse of Manfred still petrified at Stone, serving a nod to the previous episode, Yada Yada Berries. Eclipse claimed he would turn back to normal eventually, but eventually is not now. We also see Meteora rejecting Marco's attempt at feeding her, biting his arm instead. Whether or not she remembers everything as Miss Heinous, or if she just instinctively hates Marco, is up in the air. You guys all know I'm running with the former, but either way, it shows Marco has to drive to mend the damage between the two, even if it quite literally kills him. We meet the current king and queen spider bite, which, as her last name implies, are covered in spider bites. Though Princess Spider Bite, Penelope, was remedied of her spider bites by the slime monster's healing properties in Monster Bash, changing her perception of monsters. Of course, after a monster dance goes awry, and Star accuses the spider bite family of being prejudiced towards monsters, Slime himself arrives fashionably late, and we learn not only is he officially dating Penelope, but also has been healing King and Queen Spider Bite of their bites whenever they're together. The Spider Bites reveal, although they are fond of monsters, they have an issue with Globgore, opening Star's eyes up to some of the acts he didn't just commit, but prided himself on. One of which being the tapestry of Globgore burning Spider Bite Village down to the ground, which you guys may recall as the artwork found on the back of Eclipse's trading card, and originally found without Globgore's presence engraved on the ceiling of St. Ogo's Reform School. Last year, Darren Nefsey was leaving trading cards of various queens around locations in California. Man, why do we have to be the channel that doesn't live in Cali? It's revealed that Globgore was the one responsible for the death of King Shasakan, who of course was the meme and husband of Eclipsa, before she ran off of Globgore. The book is both elaborated that Eclipsa was forced into an arranged marriage with Shasakan, despite her heart belonging to Globgore before she even met Shasakan himself. Though, that's a questionable revelation, as from what we observed, Shastakan was responsible for getting rid of Meteora, which I think would have been after Eclipsa and Globgore was crystallized. Though Eclipsa confirms his event with Star, stating the truth is a little bit more complicated. So, what do I know, right? I'm sure the truth is being hid from Star, not because it'll incriminate Eclipsa or Globgore, but because it'll incriminate the Magic High Commission and the Kingdom of Muni. Remember this plot point, it's going to be crucial. This episode ends on a rather ominous note. Eclipsa reveals that the Book of Spells can be restored from a silkworm, so as long as one piece of the book remains intact. But Star lies to Eclipsa's face, stating she doesn't have any piece of the book. And going by Glossary's expression, he knows that Star is lying. As we go to Star's Closet of Secrets, where she opens a box containing the piece she used to revive Glossary. If only a certain channel that has theories about cartoons talked about the possibility of Star holding on to this piece and using the silkworms to restore the book and then, you know, possibly use a spell in the book to free Globgore. Oh my god, that was us! We caught this happening! Huh, great timing. Alright, but all cocky jokes aside, check out that video because I did say that the book of spells that we read came from the future of the show, and that Stark could restore the book from the piece she had to revive Glossaric. In the book is a spell that is specified to break Rombolus's crystals. If Eclipsa had this spell, she would definitely free Globgore, but I think Star would be the one to do it. Watch that video to find out why. Wrapping up though, what did you guys think of these episodes? Did you love them, hate them? Let us know in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at Roundtable Vids. And for my own take, you can find me at Austric Fox. We're also on Instagram. Help the Roundtable grow by either becoming a member of this channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please throw a like and subscribe to the Roundtable so you never miss any great cartoon content. Thank you for watching and I hope you have an awesome day. Austric Fox, out.